over the uh, screen. We have uh, Dr. Johnson who's going to uh, present on distal femur fractures and uh, replacement um, potential. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks so much, Dr. Pat. Um, great talk, Joseph. Just making sure. Can everyone see my screen? Yep, you're good. Um, you're still in presentation mode. We don't have your full screen version. Um, let me see. Go to display setting and flip that. Yep. Perfect. Okay, now. Um, seeing if it's lagged. Now you're, now you're good. Perfect. So I'm Nick Johnson. I'm one of the threes. I'm going to be giving a talk on distal femoral replacement for geriatric distal femur fractures. I have no disclosures. So a little bit of outline for today's talk. Uh, we'll talk about some cases first. Um, we'll talk about the prevalence and uh, morbidity and mortality associated with these uh, patients with these uh, geriatric distal femur fractures. Uh, we'll discuss some treatment options, and then we'll discuss the data on distal femur replacement as a treatment option for geriatric distal femur fractures. So the goals of the presentation today, uh, I want to foster a discussion between the arthroplasty, the tumor, and the trauma service, uh, services on this patient population um, and discuss indications for distal femur replacement. A um, couple of things I'm not covering in this topic are periprosthetic fractures, um, especially the nuances of uh, periprosthetic fractures, and then, you know, surgical treatment options in the form of uh, plate versus nail. So we'll start with some cases. Um, first case, this is an 80-year-old um, female uh, who's a community ambulator. She had a ground level fall and she sustained this uh, left intraarticular distal femur fracture. As you can see, she has a previously placed nail uh, for an intertroch uh, above this. Um, so just some things to think about, you know, how do we get her back to her baseline ambulatory status um, and how do we do it quickly and, and safely? Second case is a, um, 57 year old female who had a ground level fall. Um, she had a previous periprosthetic peri fracture around a total hip replacement um, treated with this long stem. Um, she sustained this right intraarticular distal femur fracture um, with severe comminution, um, as you can see just below um, the tip of her previously placed hip stem. So, a little bit of background on distal femur fractures. Um, they represent about four to seven percent of all fractures. It's a bimodal age distribution occurring mainly in young men with high energy trauma and then elderly females from ground level falls. Um, a uh, Scandinavian study demonstrated that up to 84 percent of distal femur fractures occur in patients greater than 50 and demonstrating um, that they you know, are a little bit more prevalent in this uh, age population or becoming more and more prevalent as the uh, population ages and uh, stay, stays active and healthier for longer. So a couple of the treatment challenges um, for uh, these uh, patients are, you know, they're medically complex patients. They have a high risk of morbidity and mortality. Um, this was a, a outcome study that looked at geriatric distal femur fractures. Um, it was a study performed in Austria at a level one trauma center. All patients were treated with open production internal fixation with a list plate. 23% um, of the patients at final fall were completely housebound, um, and one in five could not uh, uh, perform any social activities uh, for a long period of time. Only 18% of the patients were able to walk unassisted. Uh, they had a one-year mortality rate of 18% and a three-year mortality rate of 39%. Another study um, looking at these geriatric distal femur fractures, they compared outcomes of uh, geriatric hip fractures with these geriatric distal femur fractures. They found a mortality of 9.1% uh, within 30 days of injury um, with these geriatric distal femur fractures compared to 7.7% um, mortality rate in hip fractures, demonstrating that these are really similar to uh, geriatric hip fractures, and we could, should counsel our patients and uh, the patient's families that they are, uh, you know, going to act very similar in, uh, in the patient's outcome and ultimately their uh, mortality following these injuries. So with those, uh, you know, problems at hand and, and the fact that they don't always have good outcome, our treatment goal should first be do no harm, don't add any, um, you know, undue stress to the patient as they're recovering. Um, Another goal is to get them back to the, their baseline ambulatory status as quickly as possible, and then ideally do that in one surgery. So a little bit of review on treatment options. Obviously, non-operative is always a treatment option. Um, 
it's especially useful in patients who are non-ambulatory, whether that be, you know, they just don't have any use of their legs or um, they become kind of so debilitated that they're wheelchair bound, they can be treated very well in a knee immobilizer. Um, obviously, if patients are in anesthesia risk, um, the conversation needs to be had about non-operative treatment. And then, you know, with the previous studies in mind, these have very high mortality. I, I think a goals of care and this discussion needs to always be had with uh, patients before, you know, kind of forcing a, a big surgery on them. I, I think that it's obviously reasonable. We always want to help, but uh, we need to, you know, kind of listen to the patient, listen to their family about what they want um, and uh, kind of what their goals are care, of care are before uh, signing them up for any big operations. So a little bit about open reduction internal fixation for these fractures um, treated with lateral plate. Uh, there's obviously been a big evolution in treatment over the past uh, 20 to 30 years. Um, a lot of the treatment options are, are much better now than they were um, then as far as you know, plate technology and, and all that. But um, this was a previous study that looked at these geriatric distal femur fractures and the complications associated with them. Uh, it was a study out of Pittsburgh. Um, unfortunately, for today's talk, I'm only talking about native um, distal femur fractures. Um, they did include some periprosthetic um, distal femur fractures in this. They found that the average length of stay was 10 days. 82% um, of patients discharged to a SNF. They had a 25% mortality rate at one year, and then 24% of the patients um, developed a non-union, uh, with about 80% of those patients requiring a non-union surgery to get back to their baseline ambulatory status. So um, obviously open reduction internal fixation has a, has a role. There um, is also a push for retrograde nails for treatment of these, um, of these fractures um, with uh, new nails that have more distal fixation options. They, this has become a very good um, option in the treatment. Dr. Kempton Reeves previously wrote a review article on uh, nailing of these periarticular fractures. And I think it's, uh, you know, for a lot of people on the trauma team, especially it's become the standard of care um, in uh, treating these as uh, you can get good fixation in the distal segment with uh, these nails uh, that end um, the screws real distal. And then, um, you know, there's been a new push. I think if you listen to any of the trauma conferences, especially the combined weight trauma conferences, there's a lot of people that are pushing for nail plate combinations um, to do this in order to get the, uh, the patients to be able to weight bear immediately. Um, it gives you robust fixation. Um, obviously, it's a bigger surgery than just a nail or just a plate alone, um, but a lot of these can be done in minimally invasive techniques and kind of sliding the plate up. Um, then obviously, you can see from this x-ray, you can also span the entire femur to prevent any stress riser that's associated with uh, stopping your nail um, in the inner troch area or sub -troch area. So with those um, issues in mind, the high non-union rates and the um, you know, high morbidity and mortality associated with uh, surgical treatment. Um, I want to mainly focus this talk on distal femur replacement as it uh, has kind of become a good option for treating these uh, elderly patients. So a little bit of history on distal femur replacement. Um, main indication originally was for oncological reconstruction with uh, tumors around either the distal femur or the proximal tibia. Um, it's also been used in uh, revision arthroplasty where patients have severe bone loss. Um, it can also be used in revision arthroplasty where patients experience uh, um, instability. Um, and then obviously native or periprosthetic distal femoral fractures uh, is a good option. So um, one of the uh, earlier studies looking at uh, outcomes of distal femoral replacement, um, actually by Dr. Springer um, from Mayo Clinic, or performed at the Mayo Clinic, looked at 25 patients. Their mean age was 75, mean follow-up was 58 months. Patients had significant improvements in, in knee range of motion, knee society scores. About 81% um, when polled said that they uh, were happy with their surgery and had much improvement from uh, their preoperative status. Um, they also did find though that they had eight complications in this 25 patient cohort. Uh, seven patients required a reoperation, five patients sustained a deep infection, and then ultimately two patients required a, an above knee amputation due to um, kind of recalcitrant uh, infection that was unable to be cured. Um, one of the other studies that looked at this from 2009 out of Ohio State, they reviewed 39 knees and 37 patients. The average age was 76 at the time of surgery. They found um, an 87% survivorship in their cohort at four years. Um, they also reviewed kind of the current literature up to that state. 
they found a 77.6% survival rate based on the pool data um, at a mean of 53 months of follow-up. Um, so um, overall, pretty good survival in, in their review. And then one of the more recent studies um, out of the Mayo Clinic uh, looked at long -term, their long-term results from their uh, registry database of uh, using you know, contemporary distal femoral replacement uh, for total knee arthroplasty. Um, 144 patients uh, had distal femoral replacement for non-oncological reasons. Um, it was performed between 2000 and 2015. They measured outcomes, which include revision and reoperation, knee society scores, and radiographic measures. Um, about 66 of those patients underwent distal femoral replacement for fracture, either periprosthetic or native. Um, and then about 40 of those patients underwent distal femoral replacement for periprosthetic joint infection and about 20 patients underwent um, the distal femoral replacement for uh, aseptic loosening of their total knee arthroplasty. This is uh, some of the charts of the patient. Mean age was 72 years. Mean fall-up was five years. Um, they had a 10-year cumulative incidence of aseptic loosening, all-cause revision and reoperation of 17%, 27.5%, and 46.3% respectively. Um, they also found an increased uh, hazard ratio of reoperation in patients who underwent distal femoral replacement for either periprosthetic joint infection or aseptic loosening um, when compared with patients who underwent uh, distal femoral replacement for periprosthetic fracture um, or native distal femur fracture. In this cohort, in general, uh, seven patients underwent above knee amputation due to um, a calcitrin infection that was unable to be cured. So I'll talk a little bit about the distal femoral replacement, you know, outcomes in general. Uh, what are some of the benefits of distal femoral replacement for patients with native uh, distal femur fractures in this geriatric population? Obviously, one of the potential uh, benefits is early weight bearing. As you can see from the previous study, that's kind of the main previous studies. That's the main goal of treatment of these patients. Uh, potentially, you could have uh, only one surgery to get them back to this. Obviously, non-union rates are fairly high in these uh, distal femur fractures. So if uh, there can be one surgery uh, only, that's obviously a benefit. And then also a lot of these patients already have pre-existing arthritis and oftentimes are even kind of on the list to get a total knee replacement. So you kind of kill two birds with one stone um, with a distal femoral replacement when they sustain these uh, distal femur fractures. So some of the main complications associated with distal femoral replacement um, in general, especially for fracture, uh, patellofemoral issues are, are a big uh, cause of concern, um, especially it's difficult getting rotation and uh, having the patella track um, appropriately. Also, some of the designs of the distal femoral replacement don't really allow for the patella to kind of fit smoothly into the, uh, into the trochlea uh, or the prosthesis trochlea. Infection's always a risk. Um, you know, as can be seen um, in the previous studies. And then again, rotational issues. It's hard to judge your rotation um, because you're taking out the entirety of the distal femur and don't really have, you know, ligament balancing. And, and oftentimes with the fracture, um, you can't get any read of kind of where things go. So this is just a look at some of the complications. This uh, patient on the uh, left underwent a distal femoral replacement and ultimately got an infection and went on to a knee fusion. And then this just demonstrates some of the issues with the design of the distal femoral replacements. Uh, the patella obviously is not sitting well within that and patients oftentimes have uh, a lot of issues with patella tracking and, and pain. Another one of the downsides for distal femoral replacement for fracture is that these patients aren't optimized. It's obviously not an elective surgery and the timing um, is always difficult uh, to you know, figure out when you're gonna do this bigger operation as often the times that people are doing them are uh, you know, have a busy clinical schedule with either you know, um, their oncology practice or their elective joint practice. Um, many studies have shown that you know, preoperative optimization in the form of diabetes control, um, you know, nutritional status, weight loss, and smoking cessation is important. You don't have that time with these patients, so obviously the outcomes are going to be a little different than your straightforward elective total knee arthroplasty. This shows a, a picture of someone with a BMI of 70 who had a distal femur fracture, and ultimately their only option was really to undergo a, a distal femoral replacement, but uh, obviously not an ideal um, joint arthroplasty candidate. So some of the indications for distal femoral uh, replacement for fracture, 
Um, obviously, it's uh, kind of a gray area on uh, who's a good candidate, but in, in general, uh, patients who are elderly and, uh, you know, wouldn't really be able to tolerate um, you waiting the, the three months or so uh, to not weight bear um, after fixation of their fracture. Um, patients with pre-existing arthritis, complete articular fractures where you can't get any fixation into the distal segment, um, and then poor bone stock where you also can't get any fixation. Some contraindications, just like for uh, you know, really surgery in general, patients who are non-ambulatory, non um, any of those fractures that are able to be fixed with either a retrograde nail or a uh, lateral plate. Um, contaminated open wounds, although this is um, kind of a gray area. Uh, I did talk to some people who are willing to do a distal femoral replacement um, in this setting. Um, it, it is definitely uh, a worrisome thing to get these infected and um, they either usually are treated with a staged approach or um, try to fix them uh, with either a nail or a plate and then convert them to a distal femoral replacement if they uh, have a bad outcome from that surgery. And then obviously anyone who's unable to tolerate surgery. So um, just briefly, some of the pearls and pit pitfalls of distal femoral replacement for fracture, as previously discussed, length and rotation is an issue. Um, you know, it's, it's tough to get a read and you have a lot of comminution in the metaphysis and, and uh, a lot of missing bone. Um, a couple of th ways to battle that. Um, some people like to try to take as much bone out as possible and rebuild it on the back table to get an idea of how you know, large your, your distal femur is gonna be. Um, another way to do it uh, that I, talk to some people about is uh, pulling traction and taking an x-ray and then marking on the skin where you think your joint line is um, and then marking with the bovie in the wound where your joint line is um, to get a sense of, of where you're going to ultimately um, place that when you, when you put your distal film replacement in. Instability can be an issue. Um, patella tracking, as we previously talked about, um, you can have anterior cortical perforation um, as you put the stem in. Uh, and if you don't match it, kind of aiming posterior with the anterior um, cortical bow of the femur, um, you can have some issues with that. Um, lack of bone stock can be an issue um, where oftentimes you have to utilize, uh, you know, met uh, metaphyseal uh, metal cones. And then nerve injury is also an issue. Um, one of the techniques to kind of battle that that um, one of the fellows from last year told me about is getting a uh, cerclage around the, the um, basically distal femoral shaft and, and having your assistant kind of pull up through the entirety of the case. He had mentioned one where they didn't really do that and the patient ended up with a tibial nerve palsy just from the pressure throughout the full case kind of on the posterior aspect of the knee and thigh. So with all that in mind, what are the outcomes of surgical fixation versus distal femoral replacement? So this is a uh, study out of New York City that looked at primary total knee arthroplasty for these complex distal femur fractures. Um, they found that the average operative time for distal femur replacement was about 3.3 hours. Um, all patients were able to weight bear following surgery. 71% um, of their patients regained full pre-fracture um, activity level. Seven patients did require an additional aid for um, uh, ambulation. Um, and they didn't have any reoperations within their uh, study period, uh, although their study period was short with only a mean follow-up of 11 months. Another study out of the Campbell Clinic um, in Memphis uh, retrospectively re reviewed their database. Uh, they had 18 patients, all age greater than 60, who underwent distal femur replacement. Um, mean follow-up was 2.3 years. They measured outcomes for knee society score. Um, which was 85.7, uh, musculoskeletal tumor society score, which was 19.2, and the Womack score, was, which was 23.1, which are all significantly um, better than their preoperative levels. They had two complications, and ultimately one patient went on to require revision. And then one of the you know, best papers I saw was out of Charlotte um, on this and, and the experience here um, with these patients. They had um, extremely good inclusion criteria. All patients were ambulatory preoperatively. Um, and all patients uh, were uh, sustained a native distal femur fracture. Um, there were 33 C fractures. Uh, they reviewed patients treated with either open reduction internal fixation or distal femur replacement. Again, they reviewed uh, patients between 2007 and 2012. Um, and one of the strict inclusion criteria was you had to be ambulatory preoperatively. So this is a look at the patient cohort. Um, all were similar in age, sex, Charleston comorbidity index, and then mechanism. Um, 
their results, they found no difference in hospital stays uh, between the two cohorts, no difference in disposition, um, ultimately most requiring either skilled nursing facility or rehab, no difference in post-operative complications. The average time of union in the open reduction internal fixation group was 24 weeks. 18% of the patients went on to non-union. There were three reoperations in the ORAF group and one reoperation in the distal femoral group distal femoral replacement group. Zero percent of patients in the wheel in the distal femoral replacement group were wheelchair bound at final fall versus 23% in the uh, open induction internal fixation group. They concluded that um, you know obviously nearly one in five patients older than 70 developed a non-union after ORF. Um, at one year follow up, all patients in the distal femoral group were ambulatory, while one in four patients in the ORF group were wheelchair bound. Um, and ultimately, it kind of showed that distal femoral replacement remains a very good option in elderly patients with these comminuted distal femur fractures. The last study, uh, another review article out of here that uh, Olivia Rice and Dr. Springer and Dr. Karanacher did, and they reviewed kind of uh, all, the, uh, cert all the research up to this point. Um, on distal femoral replacement for um, these geriatric femur fractures. They found a 13% cumulative reoperation rate between all the studies they evaluated, 5% implant revision rate, 3% deep infection rate, 5% periprosthetic fracture rate, and 26% mortality rate at one year for these patients. And finally, um, a recent study out of JOT um, that came out in January of this year, and it was a systematic review of these uh, patients underwent distal femoral replacement um, versus open induction internal fixation or retrograde nailing for um, these geriatric distal femur fractures. Um, study inclusion criteria, you had to have at least five patients, all age greater than 60. Um, you had to have a native femur fracture and then patients were either, either treated with retrograde nailing um, or a lock plate or distal femoral replacement um, in the native knee. They excluded periprosthetic fractures and then obviously non-traumatic distal femoral replacements. Ultimately, 30 studies were included. 766 patients um, were included, including 641 patients treated with uh, surgical fixation and um, 124 patients treated with distal femoral replacement. They analyzed failure rate, infection rate, and complications. Um, they found uh, no major differences in failure rate, infection rate, um, or peri-implant fracture between the uh, two groups um, and felt that uh, obviously more research needed to be done uh, based on their results. So back to our cases. Um, case one, if you remember, this is an 80-year-old community ambulator who sustained a ground-level fall. She had this uh, intraarticular distal femur fracture below a previously placed nail. She ultimately uh, underwent uh, fixation with a lateral base plate. She went on to develop a valgus non-union um, and was non-ambulatory due to this. Um, so two years later, she was converted to a distal femoral replacement and did well with that. And then the second case, that 57-year-old female um, who sustained the ground level fall and fractured below her previous place long stem. Ultimately, um, uh, they actually had to call the company to get a um, special implant that was made that could fit um, the distal femoral replacement stem into the uh, hip stem. And these are her x-rays post-operatively, and she uh, um, did well and, and got back to ambulating without any assistive devices. So in conclusion, geriatric distal femur fractures represent a complex injury. Uh, patients have a high morbidity and mortality. Obviously, the goal is get back to pre-injury ambulatory status with as few surgeries as possible. Distal femoral replacement remains a very good option in patients with severe comminution, pre-existing osteoarthritis, and very poor bone stock, but obviously uh, is not without complications and is ultimately a salvage procedure. Um, so that needs to be discussed with the patient that there aren't a lot of good options uh, after this. Um, there are no perfect surgeries for these patients, um, but, uh, you know, Whatever can be done to get them back to ambulating is important. And future research needs to be done, uh, not only on outcomes, but also on costs as uh, very different costs associated with these treatments. I'd like to thank Dr. Springer, Dr. Karanacher, Dr. Kniesel, Dr. Pat, Dr. Uh, Kildo, and then Dr. Rice and Dr. Buck for their help. These are my references. And that's, that's great, it. Nick. Um, appreciate that uh, really comprehensive review. Um, you know, I think that, uh, 
I'd ask you sort of the same thing if we could uh, to start the discussion um, without a long explanation, just sort of your top three, when do you think this is most indicated and sort of throw in a, a hint in, or one of the indications in my book, which I don't think you had in your indications, are people with uh, balance or cognitive issues. So a patient with Parkinson's disease, patients with dementia, who aren't going to be able to protect their weight bearing. Um, you know, I don't think that was specifically in that list of indications, but uh, you know, maybe your thoughts on uh, on who this is ideal for. Sorry, I was muted. Definitely agree with that. Um, so three indications. I, I think that you know, physiologically elderly, but obviously um, uh, able to handle a big surgery like that, and um, with a intraarticular distal femur fracture with no ability to get any kind of fixation um, with a retrograde nail or a plate. Um, another patient, um, if you, it's questionable whether or not you can get fixation, they have pre-existing osteoarthritis. Um, I think it's reasonable um, if they're, you know, older and it's going to end up being a case where they have multiple surgeries um, because they are high risk for non-union and um, aren't going to be able to ambulate. I think doing a distal femoral replacement in that Circumstances is very reasonable. Um, and then third, I would say is, um, you know, obviously the, the patient who is elderly, you gave it a try with fixing it with either a plate or a nail, um, and they don't have enough bone stock for a, you know, normal total knee um, conversion and a distal femoral replacement in, in that patient group, I think is, is definitely reasonable once you've given it a little bit of time to heal. Um, I think I showed that in case one. Nick, this is Brian. Okay. Brian Springer did a. I do think your point about. I'm I'm having trouble hearing you, Doctor Springer. It might just be on my end. I don't know okay. if uh, anyone else. Can you hear me okay now? Yes, sir. Sorry, Josh. Did you have a comment? I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to cut you off there. No, not at all. My, I, I just didn't oh, hear your question. Go. Oh, I, it was it was more of just uh more of just a comment. You know, and and Nick, you did a great job presenting that, and I think there's still a lot of still a lot of controversial issues. You know that that ultimately need to work out fixation, elderly patients, stem length for some of these long, you know, lever arms. Part of the challenge with this, with with us, is obviously there's a little bit of a treatment bias depending on you know site of service. So, someone rolls into Mercy with a distal femur fracture with a predominance of arthroplasty surgeons treating them, they're probably more likely to get a distal femoral replacement. If they, if they you know, roll into Maine with a distal femur fracture that's fixable, they're more likely to get a, you know, a, a plate. And I think that's, you know, that's appropriate. I still feel like if, if a lot of these fractures are fixable, they should, be, you know, they should be fixed. And that's some of the challenges with trying to get a direct comparison in a lot of these studies is that oftentimes, there's not true equipo equipos in these, you know, in these studies that, you know, that the ones that, um, the ones that are fixable get fixed and the ones that aren't uh, get a distal femoral replacement rightfully so, but it makes it hard to get a direct, you know, to get a direct comparison. And, you know, my, my thoughts always with distal femoral replacements are it, it's, as you touched on, it's a very, it's a very sick uh, population. If you look at a lot of those studies and mortality is easily 25% in a lot of these patients akin to some of our hip fractures. And I think our, you know, our historical thought is that, oh yeah, these patients will just pop up and skip out of the hospital once we give them a procedure that they can weight bear on an hour after the procedure. And that is not necessarily case. And of course, the other challenge, as you mentioned, is when they're good, they're pretty good, but when they go bad, they can be really bad. Even patellofemoral complications, you know, which is, which is oftentimes a technical issue that it can be really challenging for a lot of these, you know, a lot of these patients um, to deal with. So I don't think we've, I don't think we've completely ironed out to say that when this patient comes in with this, it should be it should be definitely this treatment option. I think there's still a lot of kind of devils in the detail that speaks to having to to treat each of these patients very individually. You know, also as you mentioned, we don't have the opportunity to optimize these patients, and that's obviously the the challenge with our with our trauma folks is that they never have the option to optimize these patients, whereas in our elective practice we do. And this, and that's what always is the, I think, the difficult part for us. Yes, sir, definitely. That's a great point, uh, Brian, that you raised. I'd be interested in one of the trauma folks' uh, opinions on this because you're exactly right, Brian. Uh, you know, Neil Sheth and 
uh, Samir Mehta and I discussed doing a randomized uh, control yes. study of this. And we had exactly this issue was that, you know, how do you decide who to do? And it was really a struggle and we couldn't really come to any significant agreement to make it a true randomized study. Yeah, I'll comment from the uh, trauma standpoint. Nice, nice job, Nick. Um, I, I pr pretty much agree with the comments that have already been made and uh, Brian's comments that, uh, um, you know, we tend to have the bias towards fixing things and, and uh, at Maine and the, uh, with the implants that we have now, most fractures probably are fixable. The question is, is the complication profile the right, um, the right mix? And are we able to get these patients more ambulatory in a timely fashion? And I think in the last 10 years, we've gotten more aggressive as noted by Larry's paper and then also the nail plate constructs in terms of ambulation. So I think that's less of an issue than it was when we initially started looking at this, this topic, but we still, I, I don't think we've figured out the union issues with uh, um, supracolumnar femur fractures uh, still, as, as we noted in our study in the, the uh, intraarticular ones, that there was 18% rate of non-union. The complication profile overall uh, from the, the systematic reviews about you know 10% each. And I think they're, you, know, you can pick your poison, whether it's a patellofemoral issue, infection or non-union. Um, but uh, I, I think I agree with the overall statement that we don't really know who's the right person to have each operation. And uh, I think at this point, the best treatment is, is the one that you're able to, to provide uh, as the treating surgeon. Yeah, I agree, Matt. I, th I think uh, one of the, um, I think maybe the bigger question now is whether or not, is not so much whether or not we can weight bear patients if they get fixed versus replaced. It's more uh, who benefits or who, who, is, who is able to benefit from, from one versus the other. So, you know, does, do people, are people able to weight bear and mobilize faster if they get a replacement? Yeah, and, and the other thing to keep in mind is I think this is basically just like what happens on the other end of the femur. You know, it's, uh, if, you're, if in this patient population we're talking about, if you're referring to very elderly patients that have significant comorbidities, um, if you look at the mortality rate, you look at the complication rate, you look at the discharge to nursing home rates, it's almost identical to femoral neck fractures which in my mind, in, in many of the patients in this, in this age group, is an end of life kind of uh, event. It happens because they are, have, have such significant comorbidities. Um, the, the hip fracture is just something that occurs because of that. Uh, and I think that's exactly what happens in distal femur in some of the same group of people. So uh, these people uh, have the same complications. They, they're gonna have a 25% mortality rate, similar to hips. Uh, about 80% of them are discharged in nursing homes, just like with hip fractures, um, and uh, about 5% uh, are going to die within the first three months, which I think is similar to that. So, so just I think you have to look at the age group and, and the population you're talking about. So if you lump it into that really elderly, sick group, um, I don't think that matters what we do. They're going to have a bad outcome. Um, so it's really that identifying that group that's going to benefit from being up and mobilizing is really where we need to be focusing our attention. All right. Well, thank you for uh, that interactive discussion. Uh, it's nice to have these crossover topics where we get some uh, perspectives from uh, different specialties. Uh, so at the uh, seeing the time, I will uh, bring Grand Rounds to a close this morning. Thanks to everybody for uh, your comments and participation. And